Glass, and welcome to the Invisible College. I will be your instructor, Ghost Hunter Dave, and over the course of the semester I'll be joined by my usual TAs, Troy to the Max Extreme, and Dinosaur Neil. We also have the pleasure of welcoming guest lecturer, Cody Walker, educator, author, and Grant Morrison aficionado. Prior to reading the first volume of Grant Morrison's seminal science fiction saga, The Invisibles, we thought it might be helpful to lay some groundwork in order to better understand some of the themes, terminology, and practices that Grant references throughout this work. This 60-issue comic book is as much an autobiography of Grant's life at the time it was written as it is a hyper-realized sci-fi thriller. One of the best resources for gaining context on Grant's experiences is their book, Super Gods, What Masked Vigilantes, Miraculous Mutants, and a Sun God from Smallville Can Teach Us About Being Human. This book not only walks through Morrison's life from young punk musician in Scotland to comic book shaman, it also provides an immensely detailed history of the comic book medium from the golden to the modern age. If this already feels like too much reading and you're the type of person who would rather wait for the movie, I suggest checking out Patrick Meany's documentary Grant Morrison Talking with Gods from Seaport Organization. Both give a great snapshot into Morrison's life and writing. Also from Patrick Meany is the indispensable companion book Our Sentence is Up, Seeing Grant Morrison's Invisibles, also from Seaport Organization. We'll be using this as a reference throughout the semester as it goes issue by issue, analyzing and contextualizing every aspect of the series. I will warn you, however, this is recommended for readers taking their second, third, or fourth pilgrimage through the work as it gets into pretty heavy spoiler territory right off the bat. Another enjoyable appetizer to the main course is Morrison and Frank Quietly's four-issue miniseries Flex Mentallo, Man of Muscle Mystery. This is a quick read that tackles many key elements that the Invisibles flesh out in more detail later on. It's also a ton of fun and acts as a great introduction to what you're about to embark on. Lastly, and most recently, is Grant's first novel, Luda, the story of an aging drag queen and her young protege as they become entrenched in the world of magic and glamour. Like all of Morrison's work, this features heavy autobiographical accounts along with extensive coverage of things you'd expect like comics, magic, and existential examination. None of these additional texts are required reading for our Invisibles Book Club, but for those students looking to earn themselves a little extra credit or go above and beyond, these are great places to start. As you read, I ask that you keep an open mind take notes, ask questions, and join our discussion in the Invisible College Discord, free to enroll. Our first lesson will air on Monday, March 20th, which just so happens to be the vernal equinox, the turning point when daylight begins to overtake the darkness and we begin to experience more creative energy within our minds and bodies. I swear this was not planned, it just so happened to time out like that, and I feel like that's a sign from the universe. Differing from our previous book clubs, these videos will be pre-recorded to give the highest quality coverage possible. They will insta-premiere on our YouTube channel and will feature the live chat for class discussion. We will also host three live recap episodes throughout the series, similar to past book clubs, and throughout the entire reading, don't forget to chime in on our Discord as you read along for continued discussion and analysis between episodes. We'll see you all for the first day of class, March 20th, where we'll be covering The Invisibles, Volume 1, Say You Want a Revolution, Issues 1 through 8. Now, with that out of the way, I'm going to pass things over to our guest lecturer, Cody Walker, coming to us from The Invisible College itself. Professor Walker, what are a few terms and ideas that we should familiarize ourselves with before we prepare to embark on this reading? Hello, this is your instructor, Cody Walker. Let's just give an overview of what this class is. First, we're going to be talking about Grant Morrison's Invisibles. 
This is a very old edition, and it is falling apart, but that's okay. Uh, it is well loved, and um, I hope that your copies will be well loved as well. This is not a simple reading through a book and discussing how we feel about it. There's uh, a lot of deeper things that are going on in this book. Uh, we will be having discussion questions for you to be considering, uh, some free writing things that you might do to explore your own thinking and your mindset. But ultimately this is a primer for basic magic 101. Uh, not just this video, but the, the the comic itself, that's what it is. It's kind of a reflection of how we feel about spirituality, about our human consciousness, uh, the forces at work of what limit creativity. There's a lot of really huge ideas in this book. We cannot possibly cover every single thing and the other thing is, is that if you have a completely different interpretation, that is 100% okay. By no means is anyone a expert on this. Even Grant Morrison would say that we all have a different way of coming at this book. There's no right or wrong way to read it. If you're confused, that's okay. You should be. You can always leave comments and ask questions and we will try to get back to you. I think the other thing is that I remember the first time I read this book, I felt out of my depth. I felt like I didn't get it and that somehow I was not smart or that it was dumb or it was weird or something like that. And it is just very carefully, carefully crafted to be a dense read. And so this is going to be our journey together to help you through it and help you understand it. Let's talk about the Invisible College. There are two terms that you need to know going into this, which is the Invisible College and the Outer Church, which are the two opposing forces that are against each other. Neither has like a physical location, really, in terms of where they are it's sort of a philosophy more than anything so the invisible college is the idea of a meeting of the minds it is the philosophy that the heroes of our book subscribe to and the idea of ascending to a higher plane of thinking some of us view that through whatever our religious lens is whether it's anything christianity voodoo magic you know in the case of some people it could be just a a ufo alien experience it's some sort of otherworldly experience that expands our mindset and our thinking you realize that the world around you is limiting and that there is something larger than that um, emerson would call that intuition the outer church is its opposite. It is run by the, it's not even to say that it's run by, that's so limiting in what it is. The outer church is populated by these eldritch horrors, like the king of all chains and, you know, these sort of Lovecraftian creatures that are beyond our understanding. And the only reason they exist is to enslave humanity and to prevent us from ascending to a much higher plane and they love our suffering and our horribleness and every bad thing that comes from us and they've created every media or organization that will limit our our human thoughts so government language even <laughs> is uh is limited as well we'll get to all of that as as time goes on but yeah, so those are our two competing forces, is the Invisible College and the Outer Church. Another concept that we need to know is fiction suits. Fiction suits are when you put yourself in a particular mindset to make yourself successful for the situation that you're in. Morrison discusses in their article, Pop Magic, how to become a magician. Part of that is just putting yourself in the right frame of mind to 
prepare yourself for whatever the the situation may call for. So for instance, I believe they use the example of James Bond is that if you're going on a date with someone or you just need to feel confident, then you need to put on your fiction suit of I'm James Bond or whatever character that you really look up to that you see as being confident. So you play some James Bond music, you maybe wear a tuxedo if you really <laughs> if you really want to, or a suit of some sort, a physical suit. You dress up for the occasion. You listen to something that will put you in that mood. You do your hair in a certain way, or you spray a cologne that you think that James Bond might wear. You do all of this to put yourself within the mindset that I am this person, I am preparing myself for this. And that is in and of itself a sort of magic ritual. That, I mean, that is, it's very much a magic ritual. And we all do things like that without maybe consciously saying, I'm being James Bond. We might, you know, we dress up for certain occasions. We try to look our best for something. You know, if you go into a job interview, you've got a lucky pair of socks or something. All of those are little magic rituals that we do. And so the fiction suit is kind of the next extension of that. I know that I personally, like when I have a bad day at school, I had a bad day at school and the next day I've got to go in and be like a lot more stern. I put on my Batman socks and I wear a Batman shirt or I wear a, a shirt with a black tie and um, I always wear a hoodie that is unzipped because I subconsciously am thinking that it is a cape. And I go in there and just think I'm going to be uh, assertive, I'm gonna be strong. And all of that is part of the fiction suit. It may be literal clothes that I'm putting on, but it's a part of a mindset of that fiction suit in your head that you, do for an occasion. Let's talk about magic mirrors and barbalith. The magic mirrors are a reflection of our characters and often whenever they come in contact with magic mirror there is some sort of consciousness enhancement that happens or or the world is altered in some way you should immediately be making the connection to Alice in Wonderland of crossing through the looking glass into the world of wild and the imaginary and the invisibles has that same concept you might also be thinking about the matrix in which the first time neo is given the choice of the pills and he touches the mirror and he gets drawn into the mirror um, that was directly lifted from the invisibles so the magic mirror is made up of what i like to think of as the world of metaphor or higher consciousness barbalith is a part of this as well the best way to describe barbalith is barbalith is a satellite on the dark side of the moon that is acting as a placenta for human beings connecting us to the larger consciousness of the world of metaphor. That's a simple concept, right? I mean, I believe we can all totally understand it. I don't need to explain any further, but if I have to, fine. Uh, <laughs> it is the thing that allows for humans to connect to that other world, to the world of the imaginary or to the world of higher consciousness or metaphor. I think I'm going to describe it as the metaphorical world where every bit of symbolism is sort of floating out into the ether. And so we see that in Invisibles throughout the, the whole thing. But that's a, that's a concept that I think is incredibly important for us to understand when we read this book and it makes it far less like weird, you know, like if you're just reading it and you think, oh, this is just some strange thing and I don't, I don't get any of it. It's that if something is strange is because it is some sort of metaphor that's trying to come through as a concrete idea to the characters in the book. When you meet something that is just so, I don't understand what this is. That's because our consciousness has a hard time processing 
really powerful abstract thought and we have to turn it into symbols that are easy to digest and that is a central idea of the invent of the invisibles is is that we are we're so limited in our thoughts because we're human beings and we only have one brain and when we connect to higher powers through religious experiences through either or you know from working out too hard or being incredibly anxious or being afraid or through sex or through drugs or whatever when we have those really high experiences they are um, consciousness expanding and it's us connecting to the idea of, of abstract thought we're able to break the shackles that our our minds create with concrete concepts so that we can become more abstract and so barbalith is that connection that that placenta that is preparing human beings using magic mirror to get us ready for the next stage of evolutionary consciousness to to connect it to 2001 a space odyssey barbalith is the monolith um they even have have the same suffix is that the monolith in 2001 transforms um dave into giant space baby and instead of it being giant space baby for human beings in the invisibles it's the super context it's leading us to the next stage of humanity or or of reality <laughs> Let's talk about Grant Morrison's pop magic. Now, I recommend that you read the article for her yourself. It's from Disinformation Guide. You can just do a quick Google and you'll find it. So pop magic is Grant Morrison's instructions for how to become a magician. A quick summary of it is thinking about ideas as concrete concepts. We already do that. If you think about Chick-fil-A, just saying Chick-fil-A will give you any number of values or vices that you associate with it is that yes the employees are friendly and they're nice and it's connected to christianity somehow we've somehow connected christianity into uh you know a capitalist fast food chain and but then there's also the darker side of it where the profits are donated to gay conversion therapy camps and so it's pretty hateful as well and some people will will eat Chick-fil-A without any problems because what do I care? Other people have that hardline stance of I will not donate money to this, which totally understandable as well. But we subscribe to these higher ideals by eating at a restaurant. And if you can understand that basic concept, you already understand what a sigil is. A sigil is is taking higher concepts and putting them into a concrete form. The Superman S is another example of a sigil. Not only does it represent hope and kindness and being there for other people and taking care of others, but it is also a dollar sign that has made a ton of money for Warner Brothers. It's both of those things. Morrison describes the Superman S in that way and also describes it as being sort of a Faustian bargain. The only way for us to see these beautiful higher values of kindness and goodness is because it's powered by this really destructive movie studio that has its own shareholders to, to care about and they can't push too hard on the liberal socialist superhero that Superman initially was because, well, we don't want to piss off capitalists or Republicans or whatever. To become a magician, knowing the concepts of sigils like the Superman S, Chick-fil-A, the McDonald's M, anything like that, what you need to do is create your own sigil, either a sigil for yourself or a sigil for the situation that you're in. Morrison says the best way to do that is write out the thing that you want, 
mark out all letters that are repeating and mark out all of the vowels and whatever letters you have left you arrange them to look sort of like an alien crop circle that you would see in movies and then you hyper focus on it then you banish the space first you make sure everything's clean of any intrusive thoughts and think about how safe you are and then you focus on that sigil and then you charge it and you charge it using whatever sort of emotion that you want associated with that so if you're mad at someone you can scream at it I mean, you could just charge it in any number of ways. I'm not going to go into all of it. You can read the Pop Magic uh, article, and that'll help you. Um, but you charge it, and then you see it blazing in your eye, in your mind's eye, and then you have you've created some power to this. Then you go around and place it places. You draw it on things. You, if you're taking notes, you know, in, in at work or in school or something, you just make your little notes with the sigil out to the side, print out business cards if you're feeling really ambitious, and just leave them around. A little weird form of magic that I do, I shouldn't say weird, a little form of magic that I do is I like to take pennies, a penny for every year that I am, and on my birthday, I travel around different places in town, and I leave them in spots face up so that someone has good luck, and I, you know, will leave 30 something pennies all around town in all my favorite places so that people will have good luck. And that's my little form of magic that I give to the world. And I think that it makes me feel good. And, um, you know, maybe 30 something people find these pennies and they feel like they're going to have good luck for the day. These are little forms of magic. Morrison also goes into uh, much larger ideas like how do you talk to a god? Well, you do that by thinking about all of the things that that god is. You know, whether it's Hermes or Zeus or Dionysus or Superman or Batman. And you give little offerings to them and imagine yourself in conversation with them. What would they say back to you? What would you ask? What sort of knowledge are you looking for? I mean, this is no different than prayer. Christianity is not the only way in which people can talk to a higher power. Uh, I teach in a very rural district where people talk about, you know, oh, I prayed to God and he said for me to do this. And I was just like, well, okay. I mean, I get that. I understand that. Because I was in conversation with Peter Pan once. <laughs> now, I know I wasn't really talking to Peter Pan, but I was talking in my head of like, what is Peter Pan's essence? Who is he as a person? And then if I would ask Peter Pan questions, and then I would record the answers that I would get. It was a really great thought experiment, a good thought exercise to try and, and help me understand higher concepts of the symbol that, that represents Peter Pan. There are many, many other ideas in Grant Morrison's Pop Magic. I'm just giving you the brief summary, and so I recommend you go and read all of it. It's just really eye-opening. So. Give that a look, and then if you get the chance, you should read the follow-up article, which was in Heavy Metal, which I would just type in Grant Morrison Heavy Metal Magic, and I'm sure you'll be able to find it on Google. You will summon it as if like magic. Thank you, Professor Walker, and thank you, casual viewers and scholars alike. I'm excited to revisit this series and to be able to share the experience on our channel. We'll see you all for the first day of class, March 20th, where we'll be covering The Invisibles, Volume 1, Say You Want a Revolution, Issues 1 through 8. Now, pull the pin, cut the string, and enjoy. A barbalith is... Boy, it's even hard to describe. <laughs> Alright, I'm gonna do a different video about Barbell. Give me give me some time, okay?